Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this next lecture on federalism in Indian context. This is a uh, part of the lecture series on the course on democratic processes and social movements in India. Today's lecture is titled as Federalism in Indian Constitution, Changing Dynamics of Center State Relations. Under this, we will try to make sense of how the federalism or the idea of federalism has evolved over a period of time, how this meaning of federalism has changed in decades, in last seven or eight decades of Indian politics post-independence. We will also try to figure out that how historically, before the independence, the idea of federalism evolved during the British rule in India. We will also try to figure out that other than the institutional framework of federalism in the Indian context, is federalism is some kind of evolving conception through which we make sense of the democratic politics in India. These are some of the pertinent questions we need to figure out in order to understand that how federalism has worked in the Indian context. To start with, it is very important to address first the very fundamental or basic question that what is federalism. While we are trying to making sense of this idea of what is federalism, we will always try to keep this question within the larger context of the Indian politics and how this idea has evolved in the Indian historical context. To start with, federalism is a dynamic theory of nation and state building in the Indian context. Now, when we say that the idea of federalism is more of a dynamic concept, it precisely means that the idea is not static in the sense that once its definition has been set, that definition is supposed to continue as it happens with the scientific theories or scientific concepts. The concepts in social sciences evolve, change and at times also dramatically transform. In the case of federalism, we see that this idea or the concept has constantly evolved and thus to start with, we can say that federalism is a dynamic theory. The other important thing to understand in this is that this idea is about nation and state building exercise. Now, when we say that federalism is about nation and state building exercise, it precisely means that the idea of federalism is constantly evolving and interacting with the other frameworks or other concepts of politics in India. Some of those concepts are like the idea of nation or nation building, the idea of state, similarly the concept of democracy, the concept of sharing of power, the concept of devolution of power, all these things are constantly interacting with the conception of federalism. And thus, we need to keep an eye on other concepts in the context of idea of federalism to make sense of its broader understanding. Subrat Mitra and Mante Pell in their work have argued that federalism is a method of promoting self-rule and balancing the interest of nation with that of its region. Now, two things are very important in this conception as it is given by Subrat Mitra and Mate. One, that federalism is about promoting the self-rule and thus it is very clear and needs to be said at the outset only that the idea of federalism has something to do with democracy and thus the idea of federalism immediately makes connection with the very com basic conception of democracy that is self-rule. So, the moment we talk about federalism at any part of the world, we are basically talking about the self-rule and somewhere we are talking about the sharing of power. Similarly, in the other context, the idea of federalism is also about balancing the interest of the nation with that of the region. Now, here two concepts are coming into picture. One, the nation. Nation here precisely means the shared understanding about 
the formation of a polity. This conception of shared understanding of a common polity is need to be balanced with this very idea of the smaller regions which are the constituent of that larger framework of idea of nation. The moment we try to create any kind of balance, positive balance between the conception of nation as a shared understanding and the aspirations of the regions which are constituent of that nation, then it is safely said that federalism is actually about this whole act or process of balancing these two conceptions on the one hand the idea of nation, on the other hand the smaller regions. Moving to the next part of the understanding of federalism, the two conceptions are very important. One what we call as the normative conception of federalism and other the explanatory category. When we say that the idea of federalism is a normative concept, what we are actually trying to figure out is that how federalism as ought to be conception. When we say that a federalism is a ought to be conception, it precisely means that the idea of federalism is desirable in any democratic polity. Any country which has huge or large vast of geography, it is very important that all the constituents of that geography or all the regions of the, that geography get the due representation, they get their due conception of uh, development, they should get the shared conception of their uh, economic goods and whatever is supposed to be shared by the center that all should be there and thus in this framework of should be or ought to be the idea of federalism is the desirable concept within democracy and thus it is the ideal desire of any polity to have federalist structure. On the other hand when we go into the explanatory framework of understanding of federalism it is important to understand that the concept or idea of federalism actually helps us in explaining that how politics actually works. In this framework that is explanatory framework it is important to underline that how constitutional provisions talk about the sharing of power between the different layers in a federal structure and thus the institutional arrangement for federal structure and the distribution of power among those institutions and the functioning of those power sharing all these constitutes the explanatory framework of federal structure in any part of the world and more so in the Indian context. Moving to the next understanding that is that a parliamentary form and federal structure at times they may sound contradictory as former is based on supremacy of legislature while later on the sharing of power. Now here we need to understand these two conceptions which are important in the context of federalism that is on the one hand we talk about the parliamentary form of governments on the other hand we are talking about the federal structure can both go together. Here I would like to uh, share a note of caution with all of you that do not use idea of parliamentary form of government interchangeably with the conception of democracy in this context in this particular context of understanding federalism and parliamentary form. Because historically if you see the evolution of the idea of federalism uh, sorry uh, evolution of idea of you will find that this particular conception emerged in the British uh, political processes. There the idea of the unitary form of government is very important and thus parliamentary form of government historically can be or conceptually can be linked to a form of government or a polity where the conception of unitary form of government is very important. Interestingly on the other hand in the Indian context we find because of the colonial reasons the historical past and India's experience with the British colonialism that we adopted or went by the idea of what we call as the parliamentary form of government. But on the other hand because of the vast diversity and linguistic differences, geographical differences that we also adopted or went by the conception of federal structure as it was in the case of US or in the case of Canada. Now some theorists argue that this parliamentary form of government which basically represents the unitary form is in contradiction with the very fundamental principle of federalism that is sharing of power between different layers of government. 
Interestingly, the Indian polity showcases that how these two otherwise seemingly contradictory forms of political processes or political arrangements can be balanced and Indian politics in the last 75 years have demonstrated that well one can have both together under one constitutional rubric. Theory about institutionalized political cooperation and collective coexistence is another important hallmark of the understanding of federalism in India. That is, it talks about the institutionalized political cooperation among different constituents. On the other hand, it also talks about the collective coexistence. Now, this conception of collective coexistence of all the constituent elements of any polity is something which is the very basic or backbone of idea of federalism in the Indian context. In other words, we can safely say that federalism is a grand design of living together and thus the very conception or idea of federalism works on the principle of living together. In the Indian context, if you have to make sense of the idea of federalism, we need to always go through the process of what we call as historical or historical understanding of unfolding of the conception of federalism in Indian in polity. Thus, one can also say that that is the federalism has evolved in the Indian context over a period of time and still it is a work in progress. Thus, as we will see in the later part of our lecture that it has continuously evolved over a period of time and it is still in the process of evolving and we will see that in the earlier phase the very process or framework of federalism was slightly different from what it was in the decades of 70s, 80s and 90s and then again we will see in the post 1990s that the Indian polity readjusted, reconfigured the idea of federalism and evolved many new mechanisms. Rashiduddin Khan, one of the most famous theorists on federalism in India argues that federalism in India works as unity of polity and plurality of society. Now, this is very important and this is where again we can go back to our earlier formulation of contradictory phenomena in the Indian polity that is the parliamentary Indian form and the federal structure that on the one hand the Indian constitution, the Indian polity and thus the working of the federalism underlines the conception of unity of polity that is we have one constitution, one framework of government under which we have the central government or the union government and the state government and later on we have the panchayati ra system. But on the other hand, we also interestingly find that it talks about the plurality of the society and thus the plurality of cultures, plurality of languages, plurality of regional aspirations. All those things are also addressed within the constitutional framework of India. Federalism seeks to define state-society relationship in such a manner as to allow autonomy of identity of social groups to flourish in constitutionally secured and mandated institutional and political spaces. Now, these conceptions and the framework under which this idea of federalism has defined here needs to be explained and understood in detail. When we say that federalism is a work in progress in the Indian context, we precisely mean that federalism as a concept has of course evolved. It talks about the particular or unique kind of relationship between the state and society. On the one hand, the conception of the modern state exhibits some kind of unitary features, some kind of homogeneity in terms of its institutional arrangements. But on the other hand, if you look into the Indian society, it is full of diversity both in terms of the regional differences or aspirations as well as the political meanings or political nature of different regions and their aspirations. If we look into the whole accommodative exercise which this federalism provides through its institutional arrangement, then we can say that there is a some kind of very delicate balance between the unitary feature of the modern state or the uniformity of the modern state as it has been provided in the Indian constitution and 
the way federalism works or unfolds in the Indian context. Federalism in India beautifully showcases and underlines the very autonomy of the social identities. It recognizes those social identities. It takes cognizance of those social identities. Not only this, it also gives due respect in terms of providing representation to all these social identities in the parliamentary form of government in India. The federal constitution of India recognizes the special cultural rights of the people, especially the minorities. And thus, one can see that within the constitutional framework, these social identities get recognitions, the minorities get their due in terms of their cultural representations and these minorities not only in terms of religious but also cultural, linguistic as well as in terms of population. Moving to the next part of this lecture, we will see that how federalism as a state building theory has different components. Now, if you go into this idea of federalism as a power sharing conception between different layers of government or different layers of state formation, then we see, then we need to recognize that this process of formation of a state within the federal structure has many components and these components are as we will see. A state building theory states that federalism has following three essential components attached to it. To start with, formation of states and territorialization of federal local administration in such a manner as to promote closer contact between people and government essentially means creation of institutions of self-government. Now, this is the first and most important aspect of what we call as the component of federalism and that is to promote closer contact between the people and the government. Now, how to ensure the closer contact between the people and the government? We need to keep in mind that this can be ensured only through the self-rule of people. Now, how this self-rule can be provided within the constitutional framework of government, this is what the Indian constitution offers to us through the federal structure. The institution of self-rule in the Indian constitution is provided at the macro level through the creation of states, that is the different provinces or states in the Indian context. There are 28 states at the moment and 8 union territories. On the other hand, it also provides at the micro level different institutions for ensuring the representations of local aspirations. And the classic example of this micro level arrangement of federalism in the Indian context is the provision of Panchayati Raj institutions through 73rd and 74th amendment. Moving to the another important component is the distribution of federal power on a non-centralized basis. Now, this is important in terms of the crucial component of federalism that there should be distribution of federal power on a non-centralized basis. Now, what do you mean by this non-centralized basis of distribution of power? It precisely means that the power needs to be distributed among the constituent units of federal that is both the center as well as the states in such a fashion that no constituent element in this arrangement feel that the other is in the advantageous positions. And thus, there should not be any one common reference point or central point through which this power is being guided. In fact, ideally, and that is how the constitution in India also I think provides the framework of federalism that both the components that the center and the state can comfortably think and feel confident that the arrangements which is provided by the constitution is for their empowerment and they feel confident about this power sharing arrangement. Another second important component of this whole process of federal structure in the state building exercise is the creation of the institutions of shared rules. Now, the another important constituent element of federalism in the Indian context in the process of state building exercises that there should be 
an arrangement for the understanding of shared rules through the institutions. Now, this shared rules through the institution in the Indian context can be seen in the process of the constitution in India, which provides the sharing. Moving to the characteristics of federalism in India, following can be counted as some of the important characteristics to start with working of federalism in the Indian context, the structural issues and the functional contestations. Now, you see that the working of federalism in the Indian context always has the roadblocks or has the challenges in the form of the structural issues and the functional contestations. But what is interesting about working of federalism in the Indian context is that these structural issues and the functional contestations are also actually laying down the characteristics of federalism in India. If you look into the traditional legal scholarship of federalism and the understanding of federalism in the Indian context, we find off quoted word that is the quasi federal. That is, in the Indian context, the federalism is actually not the real federal structure, but it is quasi federal or half heartedly done arrangement of federalism. The traditional framework, legal framework of understanding this conception actually comes from Casey Ware's famous statement and it is following that the Indian case as a quasi federation, a unitary state with subsidiary federal features rather than a federal state with subsidiary unitary feature. Casey Ware was of this argument in 1950s that the kind of federal arrangement which is being made in the Indian context, it is unique in the sense that it provides lot more power to the center and the central government in comparison to the federal units and thus to call it federal would be injustice. It should be called as quasi federal for a very specific reason that here the center or the central government is more empowered in comparison to the constituent units. Such characterization probably fails to take into account diverse perspectives on Indian federalism in totality its formation, growth and evolution. Now, here it is important to understand and contest this argument of Casey Ware, which appears to be problematic, more so retrospectively. If you look into the working of the federalism and federal structure in the Indian context post 1970s and 80s, we can safely say that over a period of time, due to the diverse kind of formations, growth and evolution within the federalism in India, we can say that it goes beyond this traditional framework of calling quasi federal and federalism in India has strengthened decade after decade and evolved in such a manner that it has thrown a new conception of federalism for researchers to make sense of. It is true that the Indian federalism has an inbuilt tendency to centralize under certain circumstances. This nonetheless makes it quasi federal. Some people argue that of course, there are certain inbuilt tendencies within the federal structure of India, which gives us the characteristic of this quasi federal and they often refer to the idea of uh, emergency as it is provided in the article of 352, 356 and 360 to state that uh, federalism in India is quasi federal. But the fact is and as we will see in the later part of our lecture that in actuality these are some of the provisions which are not necessarily the core or the main constituent or characteristic of federalism in India but they are more of emergency provisions. To understand this particular fact and to counter this argument of Casey Vere that Indian federalism is a quasi federal, we need to refer back to the father of our Indian constitution that is Ambedkar on the Visayari idea of federalism has following two quotes and I would like to read these two quotes in order to give you a very detailed understanding that how the idea of federalism in India 
was initially conceived during the constituent assembly debate. During a discussion on the emergency provisions on 3rd of August 1949, that is during the constituent assembly debate in 1949, Ambedkar stated, I think it is agreed that our constitution, notwithstanding the many provisions which are captioned in it whereby the center has been given powers to override the provinces, nonetheless is a federal constitution. Now here you need to pay attention and understand that how he is recognizing that well the center has been given powers to override the provinces. But then in the next sentence only he is adding that nonetheless it is a federal constitution. And when we say that the constitution is a federal constitution, it means this. And this is what he means when he is saying that our constitution is a federal constitution. That the provinces are as sovereign in their field which is left to them by the constitution as the center is in the field which is assigned to it. Now here he is very clearly drawing the distinction through the constitutional arrangements that there are different domains within which the center has the power to legislate. Similarly, there are different domains for state governments to legislate, as we call as union list and state list. When it comes to union list provisions, there is absolutely no interference by the provinces or the states in the legislating process of the union government on those items. But similarly, in the same vein, one need to understand and un under underline that in the provinces or in the states also, the legislature have the complete power and complete autonomy to legislate on those issues in which the constitution provides them power to legislate. And thus, the constitution does justice to very idea of federalism by clear cut division of differences of power. In other words, barring the provisions which permit the center to override any legislation that may be passed by the provinces, the provinces have a plenary authority to make any law for peace, order and good government of that province. If we consider these three as the very basic or core of governance, that is peace, order and good government, then the provinces have given enough autonomy and power by the constitution to legislate and to function the way they want to and thus federalism in the Indian context is truly justified through the constitution. Ambedkar elaborates further on his understanding of the idea of federalism in the Indian context again when he shares his idea on 25th of November 1949 in following words. The basic principle of federalism is that legislative and executive authority is partitioned between the center and the states, not by any law to be made by center, but by the constitution itself. Now, he is not going into this conception that who has more power or less power in terms of how many domains in which the center or the states can make laws. What he is underlining here is following that this power to make or legislate on certain items by the center or by the states, it is not decided by any law which is made by the center. Had it been the case, this is what Ambedkar's argument is, had it been the case that it was distributed, this list was distributed, the center list and the state list through the center's legislation or law passed by the central government or the parliament then it would have been a quasi-federal. But the divisions of power had taken place through the constitutional arrangements and constitution itself specify that which province and which part of the government, the center or the state will legislate in which domain. If that is so, then how can we say that the Indian constitution is quasi-federal? Actually, it is absolutely federal structure within which the constitution takes care of all the fears and anxieties of the provinces. He goes on to state that this is what constitution does. The state under our constitution are in no way dependent upon the center 
for their legislative or executive authority. Now again this is very important that the states in the Indian constitution are absolutely not dependent on the center when it comes to have their legislative or executive authority. The center and the states are co-equal in this matter. Now this line again becomes very important in terms of establishing the point that federalism in India has a unique characteristic and that is that center and states are co-equal in this domain of legislative and executive authority. It is difficult to see how such a constitution be called centralism. Now Ambedkar establishes through this whole argument that the Indian constitution is actually federal and neither it is quasi-federal nor it is centralism. Coming to the understanding of distribution of power, there are three important components when it comes to understanding distribution of power in federal structures. To start with, the center has been assigned the important roles of 1. Nation building and nation preserving. Now, if you go into this two different domains within and now three, in fact, three different domains within the federal structure of India, you find that the central authority or the central part of the federal structure has the responsibility of or the important role of nation building as well as nation preserving and thus the security becomes the central reason for certain kind of powers given to the center. Second important which is the corollary of the first that is maintaining and protecting national unity and integrity and thus any kind of secessionist movement needs to be addressed and dealt by the central forces and not supposed to be dealt by the provinces themselves. The third important aspect of this whole process of federalism and distribution of power is about maintaining constitutional political order throughout the Union of India. The states have been assigned only those subjects which are purely local in nature. Again, constitution is very clear that when it comes to maintaining any kind of constitutional political order throughout the Union of India, it is the responsibility of the Union government or the center to take care of the situation rather than the local governments or the provinces left on their own to deal with any kind of constitutional crisis. The states have been assigned only now coming to the provinces or the powers which is distributed to the states. It is clearly stated that they have the power to those subjects which are purely local in nature. Now when we say that there those powers which are given to the provinces which are local in nature, it precisely means what? That they reflect the local aspirations, the regional needs and demand of those states or the provinces within which those provisions are being made. Having autonomy of legislations regulations and execution of the subjects assigned to it, the states are expected to coordinate, cooperate and execute the policies of union, especially with regard to those belonging to the nation building aspects. Now, these states or provinces this are expected to coordinate, cooperate and execute the policies of union in resonance with the kind of power distribution which has taken place through the constitution with the ultimate aim of nation building. Since in the previous slide we repeatedly used the word union, it is now important to understand this word union which is being used in the Indian constitution to make sense of Indian federalism. Actually it happens so that because of this use of the term union that at times we misjudge or miss the point that Indian federalism very deliberately uses the term union to explain and make sense of the nature of federalism in the Indian context. The article 1 of the Indian constitution states that India is the union of states. The constitution talks about India as the union of states, thereby it implies that indisciplinedness of the union and the unity of India that in any circumstances the destruction of the union cannot be imagined 
or think about it is completely indestructible and thus the unity of india cannot be compromised and whenever whenever such situation arises it becomes paramount that union comes into picture and that is the central government comes into picture and the central authority takes the situation in their hand one need to keep in mind that it was at the backdrop of the independence movement the kind of situation which was there due to partition and whole lot of other smaller states standing against the emerging federal structure at that point of time for instance jammu kashmir junagar hyderabad that a particular kind of arrangement was made in the indian context to ensure that the unity of the india needs to be maintained and thus the uses uses of the term union became very important it is the sole prerogative of the union to form the states by the way of division merger and alteration of the existing internal boundaries now through this provision of the union the word union it has been made sure or it becomes the prerogative of the union government that it can divide a state it can merge two states or it can alter the existing internal boundaries of those provinces of india as per the need and demand of the time in other words the union also possesses the right to admit any new territory in the union of india today india consists of 28 states and 8 union territories and all of this has evolved over a period of time through this application of article 1 by and large the union of india has reorganized its units on the four structural principles of state formation now these four structural principles of state formations are very important to understand here which constitutes the idea of what we call as the uh, federal structure in india and these principles are as laid down through the state reorganization commission in 1955 and they include one preservation and strengthening of the unity and security of india now this becomes very important or key component of the very functioning of the four structural principles of federalism within the state formation process one that the preservation and strengthening of the unity and the security of india second linguistic and cultural homogeneity of our country is also again very becomes very important for understanding this whole process the third important aspect is the financial economic and administrative considerations the fourth important aspect is the successful working of the national plan now all these four aspects in the due process of state formation become central focus in terms of making sense of each and every component of state formation and i will quickly go through it the first is the preservation and strengthening of the unity and security of our country second is the linguistic and cultural homogeneity which is again very important within the context of a uh, nation building exercise while maintaining the diversity of the country financial economic and administrative considerations becomes very important in terms of state formations and the successful working of the national plan that the formation of any state must not hamper the successful working of the national plan now in this context one may claim that the union has come out in existence only through unified will of the people of india not is through the national movement however certain sections of researchers contest this idea to claim that union does not reflect the true spirit of federalism here it is now important to underline and understand that when in the previous slides we talk about that how the word union comes into picture and explains the part of the reason as to why within the federal structure the center has given and appears that center has given more power that one need to understand that the whole process of indian national movement through a particular shared conception of nation national formation 
and national unity. The constitution of India reflects that aspirations. The constitution of India respects that aspiration by providing a strong central government which takes care of the diversity of the country on the one hand. On the other hand, it also takes care of the need and demand of the nation building exercise where certain kind of sharing and formation of commonality also becomes important and there only that the previous four components which we talked about comes into picture. Another important argument goes that upper chamber that is the Rajya Sabha expected to represent the interest of the unity of federation does not have symmetrical representation. It is composed on the basis of proportionality of population size. Now, some of the researchers in in last few decades have started arguing that the problem with the Indian federal structure is that the use of the word union is not necessarily reflecting the true aspiration of the Indian polity because the demand for federalism and federal structure on the one hand not necessarily goes in tandem with the very idea or the functioning of or uses of the term union in the constitution and thus the constitution is not necessarily reflective of the true aspirations of people. There are other sets of uh, theorists who work on federalism who argue that if you look into and examine this provision of the upper chamber that is Rajya Sabha, they argue that there is no equal representation of all the constituting states of the Union of India or the federalism in India. If you see that the number of uh, Rajya Sabha MPs from uh, Uttar Pradesh, you will find that it is around 31. But if you look into the number of MPs who are uh, getting representation in Rajya Sabha from Manipur or Goa, they are as small as one. Thus, there is unequal representation of MPs in Rajya Sabha and thus one can say that Indian federalism is not doing justice to the local aspirations or regional aspirations. The counter argument to this is that the provision of Rajya Sabha and the different seats arrangements which are provided are on the basis of the population of those respective states and in proportion to that population that the number of seats are being allocated and this appears to be a very wise uh, decision in terms of the constitution makers to ensure that if there is a large population the larger MPs must or member of parliaments from Rajya Sabha must represent their voices rather than the equal representation. Going into the details of the constitutional provisions regarding the federal structure in the Indian context we find that the union and the states do not have the constitutive authority to amend the essential or basic features of the constitution. Now, this is very important to understand here and we need to underline that the Indian constitution is not providing any kind of constitutive authority either to the union or to the state to change the essential or basic features of the constitution. The Supreme Court has very strongly established in the case Anand Bharti case and later on that the idea of federalism th that there are a few features of the Indian polity which are basic. Later on it has been established that the idea of federalism is one of those basic features of Indian constitution which cannot be amended. And thus, both the union and the states are at equal footing in terms of not sharing or not having power to change this basic formulation of federal structures in India. The legislative authority of the union and its states are expected to mend the ways for the achievement of constitutional goal and to facilitate the harmonious administrative functioning of union and state. Now, this second point is again very important that in case of any tension between the union and the state, it is always the supremacy of the constitution and the goal set by the constitution in terms of the nation building exercise which, which becomes important.
and thus it becomes mandatory both for the center as well as the state to work out some kind of working relationship and principles through which they ensure that the provisions made in the constitution of India need to be protected and the functioning of both the center or the union and the state must be ensured on those lines. Though union has more power to amend the constitution, the same cannot be exercised unilaterally. This point again proves that the federal provisions in the Indian constitution in terms of the centers and the state is very delicately balanced. It may appear and in fact it is so that the center has more power in terms of legislations as well as in terms of amendment of the constitution. But that does not mean that, that it can be exercised unilaterally. When it comes to those amendments which may affect the federal structure of the government, there are always the provisions which ensure that the rectifications by the affecting states or by the half, at least half of the state is mandatory to ensure that the changes are being made. For instance, provisions like revision of the entries in the three list of the seventh schedule, that is the union list, the state list and the list in which all the, the concurrent list in which the shared items are given. If any union government wants to make change to those provisions in these three lists, it needs to be always rectified by the states. Similarly, representation of states in parliament, the amendment provisions and procedures as laid down in the article 368, all these amendments need to be always have the rectification by the majority of the states in India. Similarly, this list goes on in terms of understanding that the provisions related to union judiciary and the high courts in a state, legislative relations between the union and the states, elections to the president and vice president, extent of executive power of the union and the states, provisions related to high courts for union territories which cannot be amended by the union parliament without ratifications and approval by not less than half of the states of the federations. Similarly, amendments in above needs state involvement and thus places the states on equal federal footing with the union. Thus, as we can see in this long list of provisions which are made in the Indian constitution for changes and maybe it appears that power is given to the union but the fact is that all those changes needs to be rectified by at least half of, in fact, more than half of the states. Coming to the federal union, the three components which are very important in this context are following. One, that at the societal level, it seeks to build a social union. Now, the federal structure or the federalism in the Indian context has this very unique responsibility of ensuring that it builds a social union of people across India. How it can be done? Indian federalism ensures that it permits pluralism of group life to flourish within the broader framework of secularism. And thus the secular framework of the Indian constitution provides federalism also to flourish by ensuring that the group groups are enjoying their rights in the manner in which they want to enjoy and the certain provisions, several provisions in constitution ensures that the societal unity of the country is maintained within the federal framework. A social union has to function through the instrumentality of the local self-government. Now here the local self-governments have very important role to play to ensure that this social uh, unity can be made functional. The second important component of federal union in India is at the level of national political. What does this mean? It seeks to establish a political union functioning through the synthesized construct of parliamentary democracy and federalism. Now this national political in the Indian context works through this framework of what I, at the very beginning I talked about that is the parliamentary form of government which is more of the unitary feature within the Indian polity, 
where one common parliament that is the Lok Sabha and the Ra Sabha represents the aspiration of the people across the nation. But on the other hand, in the same framework of the Indian constitution, where on the one hand you have parliamentary form of government where the union or the central government is formed, then again we have the federal structure where all the provinces or the states have their own legislative bodies and thus the representation of the local aspirations. The emerging model is that of the parliamentary federalism. Now, this is what the new form of federalism which is being thrown or uh, championed or exercised or experimented by the Indian polity in last 75 years or so. That is to establish two contradictory features of polity that is parliamentary and federalism together to achieve three basic objectives of federal nation building namely accountability, autonomy and integration. Now here we see that how this coming together of the unitary parliamentary form of government and the federal structure of distribution of power between the union and the state ensures in the Indian context something which is very crucial for any democratic society and government to function that is one it ensures accountability second it ensures autonomy and third it ensures integration of the whole of country the third important component of federal union in the indian context is that the federal union also seeks to establish an economic union through the planned national economic development now we need to always keep at the back of our mind that the Indian constitution, if on the one hand provides this institutional framework of federalism, on the other hand, the functioning of the governments and functioning of the different executive institutions have also ensured that over a period of time, there are uh, certain institutions who are helping out different provinces in terms of their economic development and they have ensured that those provinces are in resonance with or constantly evolving and moving ahead with a larger national plan and thus the national plan or economic national plan of India or the notion of development has always incorporated the federal framework within which it works. Here are some of the salient features of Indian federalism. One, that it talks about and it deals with the process of unionization. Here, unionization process allows Indian federalism to assume unitarian features, popularly referred to as centralized federalism. So, if you look into the salient features of the Indian federalism, of course, you will find that unionization is one such very important aspect of it where as and when there is a perceived threat to the maintenance of national unity, integrity, territorial sovereignty of India on the one hand and the maintenance of constitutional political order in the states on the other hand, then always this unionization feature always comes into picture and plays very crucial role in terms of ensuring that the federal structure continues. This unionization process constitutionally bestows upon the union government with added responsibility of securing balanced economic growth and social change. On the other hand, and this is the second very crucial important salient feature of Indian federalism. So, first is the unionization where you find that in case of emergency or threat to unity that feature comes into picture and takes care of the situation. On the other hand, when it comes to the diversity of the country and the diversity both in terms of cultural, linguistic and the economic aspirations, you find that the regionalization process also simultaneously helps the Indian federalism to mature and grow. As eventually over a period of time, you find that the Indian context, this whole process of regionalism and regionalization has evolved and help the nation building and state formation. A close scrutiny of the constitutional provisions reveal that constitution of India acknowledges and recommends the formation of multi-level and multi-layered federation with multiple modes of power distribution. Now, this process of regionalization 
in the last say, seven decades of Indian polity has contributed significantly in terms of ensuring that the multi-level or multi-layered federalism comes into picture. Now, I must here explain that multi-layered federation may consist of union, the states, the sub-state institutional arrangements like regional development boards, autonomous councils and units of local self-government at the local levels. All these play very crucial role in terms of formation of multi-layered federalism. Two terms we very often come across in terms of understanding federalism in India and they are symmetrical and asymmetrical. The constitution of India promotes both symmetrical and asymmetrical distribution of competence in federalism. This variegated system first lays down the general principle of power distribution having symmetrical application to all states of union. Then there is provision for a special distribution of competence and power sharing arrangements between the union and selected states and that is asymmetrical. So, the union list, state list, all those provisions, they talk about the symmetrical distribution of power, but you will find that in case of articles like earlier it was 370, later it was removed. In article 371, 371A to H, all of them represent that over a period of time through the constitutional provisions, the asymmetrical distribution of power between the union and the state has ensured that the federalism works both for the advantage of the union as well as of different states. The fifth and sixth schedule again provides those kind of provisions. To put succinctly, these provisions restrict the applications of many union laws. Panchayati Ra system again provides a very unique feature for Indian constitution to apply the principle of federalism in the Indian context and through the amendment of 73 and 74, we understand that, that how over a period of time this federalism has evolved to address the aspirations and local needs of the people and added a completely new layer to the revolution of power in the Indian context from union to center and now from center to the Panchayatira system. If you look into the working of the Indian constitution, you find that the first four decades of the working of constitution in India exhibit a strong centralizing tendency and it was because of the historical reason in which the Indian constitution was working. But overall, in last seven decades, changes to cooperative federalism can be easily seen and thus we can safely say that the Indian constitution has evolved. These are following uh, references and suggested readings for those who wish to uh, engage with this idea of federalism in the Indian context in more detail. Thank you.